Jesus said, I am Michael Pearl, and you are at the door. This is No Greater Joy Ministries. You can find us at nogreaterjoy.org. We're located right now in Loboville, Tennessee, little hick town in middle Tennessee. The door is a place where you can sit and talk about Jesus or where we can broadcast the gospel message to you. The Word of God is our guide. The Bible says the Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Those are not just words. That's been my life. And it is truly a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So we're going to open the word of God and see what Paul's got to say in Romans chapter 10. Now, he starts off similar to what he did in 9. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So Paul, a Jew, he called himself a Jew of the Jew, Pharisees of Pharisees, a very educated man still loved his people and desired for them to come to know Christ, even though he called himself an apostle to the Gentiles. But he still desired for his people to be saved. In chapter 9, he says, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. So Paul had a deep desire to see them come to Christ. So these two chapters are going to be about his people, the Jews. So why did Israel reject its Messiah? Why, now, of course, you know that the first several thousand converts were Jewish. But the nation as a whole rejected Messiah and as a whole still reject him to this day. Why? He says again, verse 2, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. So he's not putting them down He's saying that they are very zealous. He fact said of himself that he was so zealous that he killed Christians in his zeal. He said they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That is, they were not knowledgeable of something they should have been knowledgeable of. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. Now that going about is <laughs> is a verb going about. It's a verbal phrase going about. That means that it was an activity that they were fully and deeply engaged in uh, to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. But when you pray, he said, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. One of the things that the Jewish people had fallen into was repeating the same prayer over and over again. He said, when you do that, you'd think that somehow you'll be heard for your much repeating. Of course, most of the religions of the world do have these things they repeat in prayer or chants over and over again. And God finds fault with that. He said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin. I cook with that cumin. And have omitted the weightier matters of the law. So he said they were very zealous, so much so that not only did they tithe their money, but when they went out and picked a handful of mint or cumin to season with, they selected out 10% of the cumin, set it aside, and took it down and gave it to the priest so he'd have something to season his meat with as well. So they're very zealous. He said, but you've omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, they didn't judge rightly. Mercy, they didn't often show mercy. And faith, they left off faith for works. Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now the end, he's not saying that that terminates, but he's saying that Christ is the object of one's pursuit. The goal of religion, the culmination of a quest. The realization of all human need. The pinnacle of all righteousness. 
the fulfillment of all the heart's desires. He's the missing element. Unrighteousness is a result of a broken relationship of trust. So Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. He's the goal. He's what we achieve. Many people have sought righteousness through the law and failed to get it. But when they come to Christ, they find that righteousness is a free gift. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. In other words, way back there when Moses wrote 1600 BC, he described, not just stated, but described the nature of that righteousness which is of the law. For Moses describes the righteousness that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Now, you will see as we go through these two chapters, when it's marked in reddish, brown, rust color, as you see there, that's because it's a quote from the Old Testament. So every time you see that color right there, it's a quote, Leviticus 18.5. I won't be referencing them, but you'll see the, the little red notation there. So much of what he's going to say in these two chapters are quotes from the Old Testament. So Moses described it. Moses said... That which the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Now that's actually repeated five times. It's repeated twice in the New Testament. It's alluded to two other times in the New Testament. So it's a very significant passage of scripture. Romans 2.13, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So that's the nature of the law that Moses described that if you do the law, you'll be justified by it. You remember we learned in chapter 2 and 3 of Romans that no one has done the law, and therefore no one's been justified by it. But the righteousness which is of faith, that is in contrast to the righteousness of the law, the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Now he's going to quote, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Now he adds this, that is to bring Christ down from above. That's his interpretation of what was meant there in Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14. Or, quote, who shall descend into the deep? He interprets it. That is to bring Christ up again from the dead. But what saith it? This is God's response. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and thy heart, that is, he's interpreting it, the word of faith which we preach. See, he says, you don't need to go into heaven to bring Christ down to the earth. That's, of course, an impossible, ridiculous thing to think about doing. And you don't need to descend into the deep to bring him up from the dead, which would be humanly beyond comprehension. He said, God doesn't require something fantastic of you, something supernatural of you. He said, no, rather, the word of faith is in your mouth and it's in your heart. The word of faith, which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So in contrast to the works of the law, he said simply believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth will result in your salvation in a righteousness by faith. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Now, he's not giving a formula for you walking down an aisle, and this is what you do to be saved. He's simply telling us that righteousness is available to the person who believes with his heart and confesses Jesus Christ with his mouth. Now, I have to ask, where's water baptism in this, since he's giving us what you have to do to be saved? This would be the perfect place where it should be included if water baptism was essential to getting saved. Or if receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues were essential to being saved. Or joining a particular church was essential to being saved. But rather he reduces it to two things, believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth what? That Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, he tells us. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him, now the emphasis here is whosoever, meaning Jew and Gentile, as you'll see in the text. The scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, 
In Isaiah, it reads, shall not make haste. He interprets it for us as not being ashamed. In the Hebrew, do not make haste. Making haste is what you do if you're ashamed. You get out of there. And so he, he interprets it for us into the Greek mind, will not be ashamed. Now, again, we've already studied this word, not be ashamed. That's not just kind of hanging your head in embarrassment, but it is the idea of failure. You won't, won't risk coming to a state of failure. You'll be, you have confidence that this will work. Will not be ashamed, for there's no difference. You remember reading that earlier? For there's no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No difference between Jew and Greek. All alike are sinners. And the provision is for all alike with no difference. No difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Again, a quote from Psalm 86, 5. The all there is inclusive Jew and Gentile. For whosoever again, Jew and Gentile, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Again, we use this in evangelism, but he's not telling us to tell a sinner, if you call on the Lord, he'll save you. I've known a lot of sinners who've called on the Lord and haven't been saved. There's people who go to confession every week and call on the Lord, and they don't get saved. He's, he's, his word call on the Lord is broader here than praying a single prayer. He's talking about, if you go back to the Old Testament, look, they called upon the name of the Lord. It's something much deeper than a single prayer or a single few words spoken. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, if a Gentile adopts Jehovah God as his God, believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, calls upon the Lord, he'll be saved just like a Jew will. So Paul returns to express his concern for his kinsmen and to make a missionary appeal. So he's going to interrupt this progressive discussion about the state of the Jewish people with, a, he, can't, he can't resist it, a desire for us to go and take the gospel to them. He says, how then shall they call on him? He's talking about these Jews. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You see what he's done? He's opened the door and said, are you going? If you don't go as a preacher, then they won't hear. And if they don't hear, they won't believe. So again, where's water baptism? It's not in there, is it? He conspicuously leaves that out. 15, and how shall they preach except they be sent? So that appeals to the church and the believers. Are you sending out those who would go? And sending them out, are they preaching the gospel so that the, those who hear can believe? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, again a quote, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings of good things. I've often taken my shoes off and shown my feet to the congregation and said, you see, those feet are beautiful because I've shared the gospel even most recently with someone and they came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So our feet are beautiful to those who've never heard, even though our toes might be crooked and stained and our toenails uh, ingrown. Our feet are beautiful when we take the gospel to someone who's never heard it. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. He's talking about the Jews. They've not all obeyed. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? You remember that in Isaiah 53, 1? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, he's not giving you a supernatural event here saying that, that sinners cannot hear, so the word of God does a magic trick and makes their ears open so they can hear. That's not what he's saying. He's simply saying what he's already said is they cannot hear it if you don't take it. Hearing comes by the word of God going to them. And so take your Bible, open it, and share it with the sinner. If you don't, they will not believe. And if they do not believe, they'll not be saved. Hearing comes by the word of God. And by the way, make sure if you're speaking in English, you have a real Bible. 
an authorized version, the King James Version. Otherwise, you don't have the words of God. You've got the amalgamated, masculated words of man. But I say, have they not heard, that is the Jewish people, yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Now, I believe he's talking about the apostles here after Pentecost. We don't realize how extensive the first generation of Christians took the gospel. They took it to all the places where the Jews were. And they were scattered throughout all the way from Afghanistan and what we call Afghanistan today, Saudi Arabia, clean up into the edge of what we would call Spain and, and uh, France and Germany, and maybe as far as England at that time, up into Germany especially. Their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. So that's a long ways off. They took the gospel. He said they heard it. The Jews heard this message that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, was alive and offering the gift of righteousness. It's prophesied that Gentiles will come into the faith. 19, but I say, did not Israel know, first Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. That means they really don't have a structure. They're, they're heathen that don't have an organized civilization. No people, and by a foolish nation, I will anger you. And that's the way he would describe the nations. The, you know, the word Gentile actually is the word nations. So when we say Gentiles, we're saying nations, anything other than Jewish. I'll provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation, I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, that means he's kind of going out there on the limb. I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Now, why was that bold of Isaiah? Because a Jew would not have found that a pleasing thing. That the heathen, the nations, would come to God and be accepted without going through the rigorous demands of the law and the culture in which they lived. I was made manifest unto them that ask not after me, but to Israel he saith, in contrast, and to Israel he saith, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Gainsaying is when you say things for gain, like when you preach for gain, or when you flatter for gain, or when you speak to win friends and influence people for gain. He said they have become gainsayers. Their culture, their life, their social events are built around gainsaying. I've had, a, had Bible studies with doctors, lawyers, state senators. I mean like a whole big room in a very expensive house full of people who are worth at a minimum 50 times what I was worth at the time and much, much more. And their meetings are rife with gainsaying. It's so pretentious, these rich people. They, some of them can have good hearts. They come to know Christ. But their culture is one of gainsaying. And it's actually embarrassing for them. And so that's where the Jews had come. In their civilization, they'd stopped speaking frankly. They'd stopped speaking their hearts. And they learned to live in a culture where they gain something over their fellow man with their personal contacts. But to Israel, he say, all day long have I stretched forth my hand unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. So he's contrasting, because, but you have to see where he's going, the nation of Israel and the prophecies that he would save the Gentiles. So does this inclusion of the Gentiles mean that God is through with the Jews? Most Christian religions teach that God is through with the Jews. That's why there's so much scripture they don't understand. It's because they don't understand exactly what God is saying. What he said very clearly without any difficulty of interpretation. Romans 11, 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? So he's going to answer that challenge. Has God gotten rid of the Jewish people? Is Israel removed from his plan and program forever? 
God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So he said, I am Jewish, and God's not cast me away. So we, in terms of science, we can say, no, he's not cast him away because there's at least one here that knows him. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. We studied that word foreknow in the last message. Won't ye not? What's the scripture saith of Isaiah? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, so he's going to quote again, Lord, they've killed thy prophets, dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. So in other words, the prophet had reached a point in his life where he thought he's the only believer in Jehovah left in Israel. He saw nothing but corruption around him, and he was fleeing for his life, so he thought he was the last surviving believer. And what saith the answer of God unto him? God said, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Israel, God knew exactly how many. Israel had followed idolatry to the extent that out of several million people, only 7,000 of them were not immersed in idolatry. So if you feel like the Christian church is sick today, think about how far down Israel got. If you feel alone, and you say, well, there's just no Christians left. God says, I've got a whole lot. You just don't know where they are. They're in hiding too. They're isolated too. Not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then at this present time, just like at that time, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So he's talking about has God cast away his people? And he says, that's what the prophet thought. And the answer is no, he didn't there was a remnant 7,000 he said so there's a remnant right now according to the election of grace he's not talking about the individual election of each of the 7,000 or however many there be he's talking about the election as we studied of that group of people to be his chosen people as God elected Israel and if by grace it is no more of works Otherwise, grace is no more grace. We've talked about this several times in Romans already. You can't mix grace and works. If you do, then the character of one or the other is abolished, and you have pure grace or pure works. You know, it's like taking pure water and pollution. You, you either got pollution or you got pure water. You say, well, I'm just going to mix a little pollution into my water. Then you got pollution. Any pollution in the water, it ceases to be drinking water and it becomes pollution. Grace is pure. Any mixture of works and it ceases to be grace. It becomes works, one or the other. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. So the nation of Israel failed to obtain, attain to the righteousness, but the election, that is a portion of Israel, hath obtained it. And the rest the major part of Israel, were blinded. So do you see how if you don't read this in the context of Israel, you end up <laughs> not understanding this passage at all? Uh, if you try to make this the election of Christians, some were elected and some weren't, and some were blinded, you end up with all kinds of uh, Augustinian, Lutheran, uh, Zwingli interpretations, Calvin, Israel hath not attained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it. That's that small portion, the remnant like Paul was. And the rest were blinded according as it is written. Now he's going to show you that God prophesied that blinding of Israel. God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. So it didn't start with Paul. Their blinded eyes began way back in their captivity, before their captivity. And they'd been in that state of blindness. When, when John the Baptist came, they were in that state of blindness. When Jesus came to preach, they were in that state of blindness. And David saith, let their table be made a snare. Now this would be a thousand BC. And a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let, not, let their table, that's where you eat. Let their table be made a snare and a trap. 
Do you know how many people today, the table is a snare and a trap to them, a stumbling block and a recompense unto them? It's the table killing most people today. It's the table killing their children. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back all way. Eyes darkened so they cannot see. Let me get that last phrase there. I say, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. In other words, is this stumbling of these Jewish people the part that are not going to be saved? Is it so that as a nation they're going to fall, cease to exist? God forbid. So what's the ramifications of this stumbling of the Jewish people? In other words, today Jews are scattered all over the world in many nations. And by and large, they do not believe. Now, there are large numbers of Jews coming to believe. Mel Cohen, who works for us, is a Jew of, a Jew of Jews. And uh, his whole family is Jewish and worship Orthodox Jewish. And he still meets with Jews to worship on Saturday, even now. But rather through their fall, the fall of this Jewish people, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. It's like it took the fall of the Jews for the Gentiles to be saved. For to provoke them to jealousy. In other words, God's program, when the Jews eyes were darkened and they stumbled was to reach out and save a people who were no people, a nation that was foolish to save them and to display his grace to them so that the Jews would see God in them and be jealous of what they've got and want to come back. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, that is, the Jews fell, and so the gospel gets out and goes to everyone. And the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So he's about to introduce a new subject. He's saying, if these Jews, by falling away from the faith, open the door for Gentiles to be saved, how much more would it open the door if the Jews came back into the fullness once again? What kind of blessing would that be for the world? For I speak to you Gentiles, and he's talking to the Gentiles now, in so much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. He said, I am promoting my position. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. So he said, I'm going out and winning Gentiles left and right in hopes that, that my fellow man, my Jewish brethren, will see what's happening among the Gentiles and want to emulate it. For if the casting away of them, the Jewish people, be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? He's leading us into another thought he's going to give us, that God is not through with Israel. He's going to receive them back once again. So he said when he does, it'll be life from the dead. Uh, Ezekiel talked about it in chapter 38 or 39, the valley, where was that? 37, the valley of dry bones, bones coming together. And he said that's the whole house of Israel. Receiving them will be life from the dead. For if the first fruit be holy, that's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the early Jewish people, early Israeli people, actually, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches, not all, but some of them, be broken off, and thou, Gentile, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, among the Jewish branches, and with them partake of the root, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and fatness of the olive tree, the blessings of Jehovah God that were upon Israel, now upon the church, boast, this is his commandment to the Gentiles, boast not against the branches. Now why would he say that? Because he knew that the Gentile church would boast against Israel. We'll talk about Israel falling away and how that we have believed. And he said, don't do that. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. He said, remember one thing, you anti-Jewish people. Jesus was a Jew. Paul was a Jew. 
the apostles were all Jewish, despite somebody saying one of them was a Gentile. They were all Jewish. And the early church, the first several thousand were Jewish. So he said, this root, this thing you're a part of is a Jewish thing. So don't boast against it. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. So here's a warning to the church. Wilt thou say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in? That's the brag. That's the boasting. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. That's why not the remnant, but the larger body of Israelis. That's why they were broken off is unbelief. They were broken off that thou standest by faith. Be not high minded G Christian Gentile, but fear for if God spared not the natural branches, Israel, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Can you see how difficult this would be if you didn't know it was about Gentile and Jews? If you thought it was about a deacon, <laughs> a deacon that because he'd come into unbelief would be broken off and cast aside. So you got to go back to church Sunday and repent and get right with God so you can be grafted back in. I mean, I know some people think they've been grafted in 75 to 100 times. See, you got to, you got to let the word of God speak its mind. You can't speak mine for it. You can't read into it something that's not there. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell, that's the Jewish people, severity. But toward thee, Gentile, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, that's continue in faith, Otherwise, thou also shall be cut off. He's not talking about an individual Christian being cut off. He's talking about the church as a whole being cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, that's the Israeli people who didn't believe, they shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. That is the branch that was broken off can be grafted back into Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more? You remember earlier Paul writing, how much more, how much more? Moreover, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, Israel is the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. So there are several mysteries in the Bible, 12 of them, and mysteries are truths that are hidden, but partly revealed, but just revealed to those who are, have the inside knowledge which inside knowledge is available in the scripture. But it's a mystery. It's something like a clue to a deep truth. And so this is one of the mysteries. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits that, this is the mystery, blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That's the, that's the biggie here in these two chapters. Blindness in part is happened to Israel in part, not completely, because some Jews do get saved. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until there's a termination point of that blindness. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. What's the fullness of the Gentiles? That's when God has filled up his church with the last saved Gentile. And he takes his church out. His bride is complete. The last stone in his building. You see, he said, we're, we're stones builded together unto a holy temple. It says we're God's sanctuary. So the last stone will be the keystone in the dome. And so I don't know how far we are from the last stone, but one day one of us is going to lead somebody to Christ. The angels are standing by waiting and saying, well, that's the last one. Is he going to believe or not? 
and he believes. And that guy doesn't even get to pray a sinner's prayer. He believes when the Lord Jesus Christ blinks and wakes up in heaven. I mean, the building is complete. For I would not have you ignorant of this mystery. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now let's go to some charts where we can put all this together for you. We talked about the pre-tribulation, pre-millennial view, which is the biblical view, the historical view, the view which uh, anyone who reads the Bible with normal grammatical approach accepts. Okay, you see on the left, the rapture. And after 144,000 Jews are saved from 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, seven years called Jacob's trouble. During that seven years, a great tribulation takes place at the last three and a half years, actually the latter part of the last three and a half years. And then after seven years, the second coming takes place and Israel is restored to the land in Israel and God's throne is set up. David is raised to rule over the nation of Israel and all Israel is saved. Then you have a thousand year millennial reign with a great white throne judgment. And that lasts for 1000 years. And then you have the great white throne judgment and the new heavens and the new earth. Now here's another chart. This one we call the fullness of the Gentiles, okay? Israel's blindness takes place right there at the crucifixion of Christ or shortly thereafter, uh, the, the present state of blindness. And for 2,000 years now, it's been the body of Christ. That's this present age. At the rapture, the fullness of the Gentiles is complete. You see that in the middle, fullness of the Gentiles, little red arrow pointing there with the yellow one. When the rapture takes place, that's because the Gentiles are full. At that point then, the 144,000 Jews are saved and began to preach the gospel to the whole world. And that's your three and a half years, and then they are martyred. And then the second coming and the restoration of the nation of Israel in their land with Jesus on the throne and all Israel is saved at that point at the beginning of the millennium. And there's a thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. So in the passages we read, Israel is God's tree. Now scriptures use an olive tree for Israel, a fig tree for Israel, a vine for Israel, wheat for Israel, uh, lots of different illustrations are used because they were farming people, and so they understood it. Now, there's a difference between the, the nature of the olive tree and the nature of the fig tree. We won't be able to go into all that tonight, but make a reference to it in a moment. And so at this point, he's saying that it's like a fig tree, I mean like an olive tree. The reason, see, olive trees uh, have a lot of wild ones, and you have to graft them in. But you didn't do any grafting for fig trees. So he used an olive tree here because he's going to talk about grafting. So the root of God's plant, God's tree, is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who's called Israel. Now, Israel, this is Israel in their state of unbelief. Israel, over the years, stopped believing God and started just relying upon the law itself. And they fell away from the truth, from justice, mercy, and stopped honoring and worshiping God. And Israel in their unbelieving state is broken off. The branches are broken off. But there was a remnant of Jews left. And then there's a wild olive tree which bore small olives, small tree. And so the farmer goes out and he takes a branch off the wild olive tree and he grafts it in and it gives a different nature to the olive tree. Now it begins to grow and this branch that didn't bear well before because of the root now begins to bear big olives, beautiful olives. So the church becomes part of that original plant, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
The church grows to become a great tree that fills the whole earth. Another time he used it like a grain of mustard seed. He said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. The reason he chose a mustard seed here is because of the smallness of it. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so the fowls of the air come and lodge under the branches of it. So there comes a point when God is going to rapture the church out. We'll deal with that in a moment here. So the church over a period of time waxes cold and descends into unbelief with devils lodging under the shadow of it. Now of the kingdom of heaven, it said they lodge in the tree, but the kingdom of God, they lodge under the tree. They can't be part of it. Do you realize today that the church has hanging out around it and with it a lot of devils that if you go to church you're gone with devils no that's not a reason not to go if you're that spiritual and that great go there and run some of them off you know and so but why would the devils be there well why were they in the garden when jesus prayed why were they with peter why do devils come where God is working and moving? Why did the devil come into the Garden of Eden where everything was beautiful and perfect and holy? Because he wants to mess it up. And you go into church, it doesn't take you long to spot the devils. They come with people, by the way. They don't have their own mouth. They've got to talk through yours. They've got to express themselves through your heart and through your body. So every church has its devils. And sometimes it's even in the congregation, not the preacher. That's a joke, but sometimes true. So there's the old buzzards hanging out underneath the tree. And they're getting bigger and gaining control over the church today. And the church has become so corrupted that God is going to judge the church. Now, I've made a statement that has shocked a lot of people. I'm going to say it again. The rapture is God's judgment on the church. You see, the kingdom of God has grown like a tree, he said that, and filled the whole earth. But it's full of devils, and those devils are in people. And I think there's more, more devil members than there are holy members in the church. You know, the Antichrist is not against Christ. He comes as a Christ, and he's followed by Christians. The Antichrist is not a Muslim movement, it's a Christian movement. He'll gain a lot of believers who receive his mark because he'll perform miracles and signs and wonders and he'll be on TV and he'll be charismatic, his hair will be curly and he will be well dressed and he'll have little rings on his fingers and, and he will be compassionate and powerful and wonderful and moving and he will speak high and lofty things about God. And then he will claim and allow people to believe that he's the Christ. And he will take the glory meant for God. There will, there will have been a few people missing by this time, the true believers, the remnant gone. But like Israel, great number left behind whose hearts were hardened. Most of the church will be left behind. It will still function. And judgment will fall upon the church. Christians talk about going through the persecute, or going through the tribulation. There'll be a lot of them going through it, but it won't be born again Christians. There'll be a lot of them that will need to get their hideaways and get their food and stuff because the only way they will get to heaven, actually into the millennium, is by not receiving the mark of the beast, and by the way, dying a martyr's death. So if I thought I was going to go through the tribulation, I'd move to a big city as soon as the rapture took place and I'd start preaching. I'd get with one of the 144,000, make sure my head got cut off so I could go to heaven because that's the only way you'll get there. There won't be any getting born again then. And you actually won't get to heaven. You just get into the millennium and you still might go to hell, but you get into the millennium at least and have a chance. So the church waxes cold descends into unbelief and devils lodge under the shadow of it. So here's what God does. Watch the tree. 
He judges it, cuts off the branches. Remember what he said he's going to do? If you don't abide in belief, you'll cut off the branches. Remember all the prophecies that the church wouldn't abide in belief? Jesus said, when I come, shall I find faith in the earth? He said, the hearts of many will wax cold. And he describes all the sins that the church would descend into. In the book of Revelation, he talks about the lukewarm church of Laodicea. That he said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And that's what you have in the tribulation is God's vomit left over from the church judged Israel after the rapture Israel's been lying fallow now for 2,000 years if a Jew gets saved he's cast out of Judaism he's banished there are times in Europe they won't even speak their name they have a funeral and that's the end of them so watch the picture God said Watch out, I'm going to graft them back in again, the natural branches. And they're going to bear fruit, 144,000 at first. And then many more will be saved. So here's the mystery revealed. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. This is a prophecy that God will take away the sins of this cast off people. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. So Paul said right now at that time when he was writing, the Jews were the enemies of Jesus Christ and the gospel. But as touching the election, because they were elected, remember that? God elected the people of Israel, a nation. Touching the election, they, as a group, are beloved for the Father's sake. So Israel is still, Israel in unbelief is beloved for the Father's sake. If you don't love Israel, you're not loving what God loves. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That verse has been used out of context so many times. People use it to defend that tongues hasn't passed away. I don't think it passed away either, but that verse is not one used to defend it. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God gave the gift of tongues, so we've still got them. God gave the gift of healing, so we've still got the gifts of healing. Yes, the gifts are still present, when, but there's, it's fake so much you can hardly tell the real from the fake sometimes. The gifts and calling of God, he's talking about God electing the nation of Israel, calling them. And God is not through with them. It's without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. He's talking to the Gentiles. You obtain mercy through their unbelief. Even so, have these also now not believed that through your mercy they may also obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So he said, God has worked this plan through their unbelief. So they'll reach a state like Abraham and Sarah did, to where they're totally barren and there's no hope. And then God will supernaturally come back, having provoked them to jealousy. You know, what's going to make them more jealous than having millions of Christians disappear? And finding out that the ones they always thought were hypocrites were left behind. That the sincere, godly Christians were the ones taken out. And the mass of Christianity is left behind. They're going to be able to make a judgment. They're going to say, you know, these people believed on Jesus Christ, a Jew. They said he was raised from the dead. And their book said he was coming back. And it said that he would call them his people, which were not his people. And he'd provoke us to jealousy. Don't you know there's going to be a lot of scripture these 144,000 be preaching. And many Jews will be converted to Christ. And Antichrist will come against them when he sees he's losing. He tried peace for the first three and a half years. And that failed. So he is going to try force. He's going to come against the nation of Israel and drive them into the wilderness south of Judea. And there God is going to feed them manna from heaven 
like you did in days of old. And at that point, the, there will be a great flood of water released through some dike or dam that will be built at that time, or probably backing up the Dead Sea, raising its level 1,500 feet, released into the valleys where the Jews are hiding and try to drown them out of their caves. But the Bible said the earth will open up and swallow the water and they will be saved. Antichrist in his rage will suddenly find that God is serious about his people. And he will send all kinds of plagues and diseases and destructions upon the people. And they won't have time to chase Jews then. They'll be hiding in the rocks and the dens, praying the rocks will fall on Adam from the face of the lamb and from him who sits on the throne. And they will curse, the Bible said, God in heaven and those that are there with him in heaven. They'll know the church has been raptured out, the true believers. So Paul concludes these two chapters. He has to worship for a moment. He has to celebrate. He says, all the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. He said, this is, this is, this, guys, this is great, you know. This is just overwhelming. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, he's quoting Isaiah, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. In other words, we traded something, we gave him something, he gave us something back. He said, is that the case? Uh -uh. For of him, and through him, and to him. Of him, that makes him the origin of it. Through him makes him the channel of it, and to him makes him the object of it. Of him, all things are of God. All things are through him. All things are to him. And all are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. So Paul is celebrating. Now I'm going to take you right back through those graphs real quick while you've seen the last scripture so you can get it in your mind again. First, we're going to go through three passages of scripture. You're going to see this Jesus' words in the Gospels, you're going to see it in a way you haven't understood it before. All right? He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree, not an olive tree this time, a fig tree, planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years, three years, Jesus' ministry, three years. I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Three years, Jesus didn't find any fruit. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also. It was about a year before Jesus was crucified. Till I shall dig about it and dung it. That's fertilize it. And if it bear fruit well, if not, then after thou shalt cut it down. Well, that's a... Pretty good parable, isn't it? Wait till you get the rest of it. And seeing a fig tree off, uh, far off having leaves. This is just a week before he's crucified. He came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. You know, I was out at my fig trees today, but I wasn't looking for fruit because the time of the figs is not yet. I was out there cutting it, portions of it down to the ground, like he talked about here. Now, why would Jesus go look at a fig tree at the wrong time? And then Jesus answered and said unto it, he's talking to the tree now, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. You know, there's no interpretation or explanation of that parable. It looks like Jesus had a little fit there. Looks like he, he wanted figs at the wrong time of the year and cursed the tree and the thing died. But right before his crucifixion, you've got to know that there was a lesson in this and other scripture bear out what that lesson is. That Israel, after three days, would be cursed and cut down if it didn't bear fruit. But what did he say? It's not the time yet. God knew it wasn't the time yet. Luke 3. 
Now also the ax is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree therefore which bringeth not forth fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Luke 21. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. He's talking about uh, the nation of Israel. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That prophecy of Jesus is that Jerusalem would be trodden down of Gentiles until the end of the church age. Is Jerusalem trodden down of Gentiles today? If you go over there, you will walk through the old city and three fourths of it is occupied and owned by Gentiles. You've got an Arabic quarter, a Muslim quarter, that's Gentile. You've got a Catholic quarter, that's Gentile, and you've got an Orthodox church quarter, that's Gentile, and one quarter of it is Jewish. Trodden down, and when you walk through the old city, you're bumping into G Gentile tourists from every part of the world. At the Wailing Wall, it's full of Gentiles gawking and taking pictures. Everywhere you go, it's trodden down. He said, it will be trodden down until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the power of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall they see the sign of the son of man in the cloud with power and great glory. This is the second coming, not the rapture. And when these things begin to come to pass, these signs, he just gave her a limited number of them. When they begin to come to pass, then look up and lift your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable. Now here's his parable again. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. Now the fig tree is Israel, all the trees are the nations. When they now shoot forth, and that's like when I went out today, uh, it's still winter time, late winter time. Buds were shooting forth on my fig tree, just little buds getting ready. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When, you sh when, you, when they shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation that sees these buds shoot forth shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now you say, why did he say, Jesus say, cut the fig tree down? Different from an olive tree, if you cut a fig tree off at ground level so it disappears, you know what happens to it? It grows right back. You can't kill it that way. And in fact, he said, dung around it, and if it bears fruit, fine. If not, cut it down, because an olive tree wouldn't do that. You cut it down, the root is gone. But the nation of Israel is like the fig tree in that respect. God cast them off. He cut them to the ground. But there's life in that root, and it's going to produce a new tree, a new plant. This generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. So here it is. Notice again the fullness of the Gentiles. Maybe you understand it better now having seen more scripture. Israel's blindness, the fullness of the Gentiles, the rapture, the restoration of Israel. God's, God's um, tree, which in this case is an olive tree, because we have to uh, graft into it. Abraham, Isaac, and Israel is the root. Israel in unbelief, the fruit falling from the tree, unbelieving Israel broken off, that happened during the first generation of Christians. Our remnant were saved. Wild olive tree, Gentile nations are cut out and grafted into the root. So for 2,000 years now, the root has been bearing fruit through the Gentile nations, the church. The church waxes cold, descends into unbelief with devils lodging under the shadow of it. And then the rapture takes place. God snatches away Israel, or the church. And then here's Israel after the rapture. God grafts Israel back in. 
and Israel bears fruit. So that's our pre-tribulational, pre-millennial. Notice the 144,000, that's the fruit that they will bear right away. And that's Romans chapter 10 and 11. Thanks for studying God's Word with us. You can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, and Twitter, or contact us by email at thedoor at nogreaterjoy.org. The Door is a production of No Greater Joy Ministries. For more of Mike's teachings, as well as hundreds of other great resources on child training, marriage, family, and faith, go to nogreaterjoy.org. While you're there, download Mike's free audio teaching on Romans, and check out Mike's award-winning graphic novel, Good and Evil, now available in over 48 languages and as an animated video. See you next time at The Door.